We have, in this season, been in our study of the book of Colossians. Uh, last week, Nick Kidwell served us so effectively, a little something I like to call killing it. And uh, makes me so excited to see Nick uh, leading a church plant and a church in the future. Uh, I believe God's put us in the book of Colossians for a reason. And so today, in speaking on the Christian and the coronavirus, I want to return to look at Colossians 1, verses 3 through 5. You may remember that Paul wrote this letter from prison. He was unable to see people in person. He had never visited these saints in Colossae, but he used the technology of writing from a distance to encourage them in the truth. This is Colossians 1. We'll begin reading in verse 3. I'm not going to have you stand for the reading so you can stay on your sofa or laying on the floor or however you're listening to this. This is God's holy and authoritative word. Colossians 1 verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. May God bless the preaching of his word. For the rest of our lives, I am sure we will remember what our world is presently experiencing. In January, an outbreak was identified as a new coronavirus causing a highly contagious disease now known as COVID-19. On January 21st, the U.S. announced its first confirmed coronavirus case, and by the end of January, the World Health Organization declared the outbreak a global public health emergency. The number of deaths continued to rise as the stock market continued to plummet. Travel bans were imposed, lockdowns were announced, and on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak to be a pandemic, uh, the worldwide spread of a disease for which most people do not have immunity. Professional sports have been suspended. Nations have sealed their borders. Schools and businesses have closed. Gatherings have been canceled. Residents in some places have been ordered to stay home. And we do not know what tomorrow holds. Our daily lives have been profoundly impacted by this pandemic. Social distancing has radically altered our social lives. Some are experiencing a deep sense of loneliness. Uh, there is the disappointment of canceled events and trips and other plans. We, as you know, are unable to gather as a church on the Lord's Day. Many are experiencing financial loss. Um, some have lost their job. The virus, along with the illness and the hospitalization it causes, has made its way into our church family. There are fears surrounding our own health and the health of those we love. And we look with uncertainty to the future at this point, not knowing how bad things will get and how our lives and our world will be changed by this pandemic. How does God call us to respond in times like this? How does God call us as his people, as Christians, to respond in times like this? Our present situation is certainly unique in the history of the modern world, and yet it is good to remember that we are not the first to face catastrophic events, and we will not be the last. The book of Colossians, in fact, was received and read by a people who were likely on the brink of a devastating event of their own. 
Uh, Colossians was written around 60 or 61 AD to a church in modern day Western Turkey. Historians say that a few centuries earlier, it had been a great city with a thriving economy. In the third century before Christ, it was a business center and the most important city in the area. Uh, they controlled the textile industry. There was a beautiful dark red wool known as Colossian wool. But then things had declined. And right around the time that Paul wrote this letter, it was probably just shortly after, that entire region was ravaged by a devastating earthquake. Uh, much of the city was destroyed and lives were lost. So think, think about this. Uh, this letter that we have been studying as a church family leading up to this time was originally written by a people, uh, received by a people, studied by a people who unknown to them faced a sudden upheaval in their society as well. But the message of this letter would be used by God to prepare them for unknown and unexpected disaster. How? By centering their faith on Christ and the hope of the gospel. Colossians 1.17, you remember when we got to that verse, presents Christ as the one in whom all things hold together. He is the one who sustains and upholds all things, and commenting on that verse, Sam Storm says, if that earthquake hit Colossae soon after their reception of Paul's letter, I suspect they would have encouraged one another with the reminder that in Jesus, their Lord and Savior, all things still cohere. All things were upheld. If there is a shaking, it is because the Lord has willed it. No matter how widespread the destruction, no matter how disconcerting the loss, listen, Jesus has not lost his grip on this world or their lives. And Storm says, I pray that you and I will do what I trust the Colossians did as they labored to put their lives back together following that incredible shaking. Confidently rest and trust in the one who holds all things together and continues unabated and undeterred in the pursuit of his purpose for our spiritual good and his everlasting glory. How does God call us to respond in times like this? What does God say to us in this situation in the midst of our present shaking and loss? There is a Christ-centered way to respond to this present crisis. And it is summarized in three words in our text. Faith, love, and hope. These are the three best ways to respond to this present crisis. Everything else may be canceled. These are not canceled. Faith, love, and hope. It's a triad that often appears in Scripture as the essence of the Christian life. What makes the Christian distinct from the world, those who are apart from Christ, is that we have, in the words of the text, faith in Christ Jesus, love for all the saints, referring to other Christians, and hope laid up for you in heaven. And just as in verse 3, Paul thanked God for their faith, love, and hope as he prayed for them. So we as pastors thank God for the faith and the love and the hope that we are seeing on display in your lives during this time. As we pray for you, we do petition. We are asking God for things. But you also need to know that those prayers are filled with thanksgiving for how the grace of God is at work in your lives. The Spirit of God is at work even now, filling you with faith, love, and hope. He is strengthening these things in us. How do Christians respond to the coronavirus? Three points looking at faith, love, and hope. First, we allow our faith in Christ to be our security. Faith 
has to do with where our confidence is placed. Faith means placing our trust and our security in the one who has always proven faithful. We look to Christ for salvation. We look to Christ for security. We do not rely on our own good works for salvation because no one is good and all have sinned and all deserve God's righteous judgment. Faith does not rely upon self but upon Christ who died for our sins and rose to new life for our salvation. And hear this, the good news is that even a weak and doubting faith is enough to rely on Christ. Tim Keller in his book, The Reason for God, explains faith like this. He says, imagine you are on a high cliff and you lose your footing and begin to fall. Just beside you is a branch sticking out of the edge of the cliff. It is your only hope and seems more than strong enough. How can it save you? If you are certain the branch can support you, but you don't actually reach out and grab it, you are lost. If instead your mind is filled with doubts and uncertainty that the branch can hold you, but you reach out and grab it anyway, you will be saved. Why? Keller says, it is not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. <laughs> Strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. Christ is the strong branch. He is the only way for sinners to be rescued. If you have not placed your faith in Christ for salvation, do so today. I have prayed to this end. May it be that many look back on this time and say, it was when the coronavirus was spreading that I was saved. That I came to know the peace and the joy that are found in Christ that I had never known before. We not only continue the Christian, begin the Christian life by faith, we continue the Christian life by faith in Christ, meaning that we look to him for our security every day of our lives. Everyone places their faith in something, their confidence in something, your job, your planning, your financial security, your family, your good health. Left to ourselves, we put our faith in our ability to control our lives. And perhaps the clearest example of that has to do with toilet paper. Um, I read an article where psychologists were explaining about how our brains push us to panic buy toilet paper uh, even when there's no need to. One man explained, in times of uncertainty, people enter a panic zone that makes them irrational and completely neurotic driving them to do unreasonable things like buy a year's worth of toilet paper, spoken as a psychologist would. We're all irrational and completely neurotic, just running around in a panic. But they called it in this article, retail therapy. And there was this line there. They said, it's about taking back control in a world where you feel out of control. <laughs> well, the coronavirus has reminded us all of our fragility of our lack of control. This week I was sharing with my fellowship group over a Zoom call some of my temptations to anxiety these days. Uh, there's a book called Running Scared by Ed Welch that I've pulled off the shelf. I'm actually reading my copy. Uh, Megan, my wife, is in the other room reading her copy. So we're all, you know, hoarding something. My Choices. Ed Welch's book on anxiety, Running Scared. Here's one thing that I read this week that helped me. He says, worry reveals our allegiances. Fear and worry are not mere emotions. They're expressions of what we hold dear. They reveal the loyalties of our hearts. If we know Christ and have affirmed our allegiance to him... Worry is a sign that we are trying to have it both ways. <laughs> we want Jesus, but we also want to look 
for help and security elsewhere. And God is calling us to look to Christ alone. God is calling us to deepen our faith in Jesus Christ. He's inviting us into the peace of trusting in him. Faith cannot live by feeding on the news. The news will not feed your faith. It is more likely to feed fears. In John 14, 1, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Faith. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And in Colossians 3, verse 2, it says, set your minds. Where are you setting your mind? Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Here's one of the things I believe God is doing I believe God is growing and maturing our faith during these times. Faith is the conviction that God is sovereign and that God is good. Faith is not blind to the trials of life, but faith declares, even from the ashes of sorrow and loss, faith declares that the Lord knows what he's doing. God has not forsaken us. God has not given up on you. The king of love remains on his throne. Can any of you say that God has ever failed you? Can any of you say that you have ever walked alone? Well, then trust in him. Trust in the Lord. I pray for government leaders, but I do not put my trust in them. I thank God for healthcare workers and medical researchers, but I do not put my trust in them. My trust is not in the economy or in money. My trust is not in predictions and statistics. My trust is not in medicine, in health, in long life. I have placed my trust in the name of the Lord our God. He alone is worthy of our trust. And when nations quake, And when kingdoms totter and when economies fail and the earth gives way, when everything else is lost, God remains. He is the unfailing refuge. He is strength in our weakness. He is a very present help in time of trouble. And therefore, all who trust in him will not be moved. Christian, Christian, allow faith in Christ to be your security. Allow faith in Christ to function for you by relying upon Christ and his character and his promises and his goodness every day of our lives. How do we respond to the coronavirus? Second, we love by considering the interests of others. Faith, now love. The church is a community of love. We experience the care and the belonging this world is searching for. Christ has loved us with an amazing love. He laid down his life for us in our place, bearing the wrath of God that we deserve in order to rescue us and bring us back to God. And in saving us, God creates in us the presence of love, love for Christ and love for each other. Jesus says in John 15, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And you remember Jesus says that the world would believe the truth about him when they see the love that we have for each other. Members of Covenant Fellowship Church have a special obligation and opportunity to love other members in our church family. We love with our initiative our prayers, our acts of service, our eager anticipation of when we can safely gather again. Be aware of those in your community group who are affected and reach out to them through a call, through a text, through an email. 
Who are the fearful? Who are the lonely? Who are the depressed? Who are the high risk or the sick? Who is jobless or financially impacted? What disappointments are others experiencing? You can consider developing a prayer list and let people know how you are praying for them. It will be one way that you can walk in love toward others. This is a time that we as a church family absolutely must stick together and walk in love. In the absence of gathering on Sunday morning, our community group meetings, which will happen through Zoom, become all the more important. And think about this. What if this is one of the good things that God is doing in our church family during this time? Getting us involved in our community groups again. Learning the needs of others. Bearing each other's burdens. Having our hearts knit together in love. I would love to see every member of the church joining their next community group meeting through Zoom. You know, and here's the thing. <laughs> Suddenly, a lot of our excuses for not attending no longer apply, right? You don't need to leave home. We're doing it on the computer. And it's not like you have a lot going on these days. You need this interaction with the saints. It will position you to walk in love toward others. We have an opportunity as well to practice generosity in a time of fear and self-protection and hoarding. I think we all feel this to a degree, this, this impulse, this temptation in these days of a rapidly declining economy. We feel the impulse to hold on more tightly to what we have or the impulse to give, but to give reluctantly and fearfully. That is not a loving impulse. God loves a cheerful giver, and giving is an act that pleases the Lord. We can give of our time. We can give of our resources, our money, to bless others. I was so grateful and encouraged to learn that within the first 24 hours of our announcement of the Benevolence Fund, we received several thousand dollars from the church. Thank you for being that kind of people. The money that we give to the church through regular giving and through giving to the Benevolence Fund is serving during this time to advance the gospel, to care for God's people. And when we give, it helps to, to break the stronghold of greed in our hearts. And so Megan and I have been talking about our plan. All right, let's move towards generosity. Let's move towards blessing. Let's resist the impulse to fear and self-protection. How else can we love? Well, in these days, it is loving to continue practicing social distancing. Uh, it is loving to wash our hands more frequently and thoroughly and to maintain space between others. Uh, we should be motivated to use caution, not primarily out of self-interest, but out of a desire to not put others at risk. Please do not mistake prudence for panic. Do not be reckless. Do not make the mistake of thinking children and young people are immune. And here's another way we can love. Let's avoid sinful judgment. We will experience the temptation to criticize others who are processing this crisis differently, either with more or less concern or with more or less emotion or with more or less preparation, um, or we'll be tempted to judge those who make different decisions than we do about social behavior. If you choose to criticize everyone who responds differently than you do within the stated recommendations, there will be no end to the social judging that you participate in. Wouldn't it be better to put on kindness and to put on grace and to walk in love? As we consider this call to love, I want to encourage you to show special love to those in your home, your family, during this time. If you have sinned against your spouse or your children this week through anger, through yelling or quarreling or irritability, you are obligated by God to confess your sin and to seek forgiveness. Husbands, this is a time for you to excel in cherishing and blessing 
your wife. Serve her. Give her a break. Take the kids outside. Lighten her load. To children and youth who are likely spending more time with your brothers and sisters these days, this is an opportunity to love. So if I can have the attention of any kids or youth who are watching, you're spending time with your siblings. Listen, here is a crazy idea I have for you. Look to bless a brother or sister. Okay, look to bless them. Share what belongs to you. Let them go first. Give them the best seat, the greatly coveted seat during the movie. Look over an offense. Speak in ways that are loving and respectful. Our homes should be places of love and you can play your part in that. You can honor the Lord and help your parents through your example and the tone that you set in the home. We love by considering the interests of others and what an opportunity we have to consider how the spirit of God is leading us in this time to walk in love. Third, third point, we look to the future with unshakable hope. Is part of the Christian response to these days, we look to the future with unshakable hope. The faith and the love we display are, the text says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. It's when we live with an awareness of the hope that is ours, when we live with an awareness, with confidence in the future that is ours in Christ Jesus, that then faith runs deep and love is made strong. These spring from the hope that we have of our future in Christ. This is a time in which Many are focused on the future. Everyone is talking about what these next few months, will be, the, the timelines, the wondering about what the next six months and beyond will look like. We are wondering and un- uncertainties abound. We, we have been reminded of the reality of death, even as we look to our own future. And we are forced to face the question of what hope we have in death. What is needed is Christian hope. But this is different from the way we often think about hope. Hope doesn't mean putting a positive spin on things or always looking at the bright side. Hope doesn't mean that we join those who are trying to calm people down by comparing COVID-19 to things that are worse. All right, that's not being hopeful. That's being a miserable comforter. Uh, that's, That's not walking in sympathy toward others. Hope, here's what, here's what hope is. Eliminate any wrong ideas about hope from your mind. Hope presupposes the presence of difficulty and an awareness of difficulty. You're not shutting out the difficulty. You are seeing it. You are aware of it. You are affected by it. One of the beautiful things about Christianity is that it is utterly realistic about the brokenness and pain of this world. And at the same time, it is full of hope regarding the future because of God's promises in Christ. In Hebrews 6.19, hope is described as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. We are in the midst of the storm. We are presently out at sea and the weather is far from calm. Winds are raging and waves pound against us. And if we do not have a good, strong anchor in the midst of this pandemic, we will not make it. Without an anchor, the ship is thrown against the rocks or against the shore. Now is the time to cast the anchor of hope which will stabilize and keep us until the storm is past. When you have an anchor in the storm, uh, it doesn't make everything peaceful. Uh, the, The ship goes up and down 
But you're not thrown upon the rocks. You are not driven away into peril. Our hearts in these days of trouble will certainly rise and fall upon the waves. We will know unrest and fear and sorrow and doubt. But all along, we are kept by the anchor of our souls. Here's what I find. Most often, our hope is not functioning the way it ought to function. In times of ease and great comfort, the waters are calm and we do not cast the anchor. And this is especially the case in the Western world where we have lived such comfortable lives and most of us have not known hunger or homelessness or physical persecution. And so... Hope is, is there, certainly, but it doesn't function with strength. It doesn't captivate our hearts and our minds. But then here's what happens. In times of hardship, in times of uncertainty, in times of difficulty and loss, the Spirit of God causes hope to rise in our souls. We realize that hope is all we have. Our hope is not that we will not face trials. Our hope is not things aren't as bad as they seem. Our hope is not about the inevitability of human progress and the triumph of improvement. Uh, Marianne Thompson, in her commentary on Colossians, speaking of hope, says this, Christian hope is utterly realistic about the human capacity for evil and the doubtful march of human progress, well aware that there is no guarantee that things will get better. The book of Revelation, for example, testifies to the opposite expectation, and hope is aware of that possibility. Therefore, Christian hope has at its heart a trust in God's action for the salvation of the world. Put differently, progress focuses on what happens in this world, while hope focuses on what comes to this world from the transcendent realm where Christ now is. This does not mean that there is no hope for this world, but rather that hope for this world does not come from within this world itself, but from the creator who fashioned it, who sustains it, and who will recreate it. God is our hope. His activity, his salvation that is what sustains us when things clearly don't appear to be getting better. We are learning that in this life, nothing is safe. Nothing is secure. But our hope is. Because our hope is in Christ and His coming. Our hope is a hope that is laid up for you in heaven. It is absolutely and totally secure. So cast the anchor, live with hope. Satan would love to have this be a time to use these present troubles to beat down our hope. Christian, we must not allow it. You must say, no, I have a hope that is laid up in heaven so that in every trial, in every loss, whatever trouble may come, my hope remains. It is true, yes, Satan, that I am subject to sickness here, but one day I will have a glorious body along with all the redeemed, a body that is never sick. Sorrow and distress and weakness will be gone. I have the sure hope that when I die, I will be with Christ. And the ultimate hope that when Christ returns, we will see him face to face in glory with all the great multitude of the redeemed, praising him for all eternity. Friends, we can be a people of hope and we can live now in such a way that this hope is seen by the world and spreads to others. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says that we should always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in us, yet do it with gentleness and respect. As followers of Christ, we 
look to the future with unshakable hope. As World War one was coming to a close. Uh, the Spanish flu or the 1918 influenza pandemic was spreading across the globe. It was the most severe pandemic in recent history. It is estimated that around 500 million people became infected, which was one third of the world's population. At least 50 million died with about 675 thousand of those deaths occurring in the U.S. A man named Francis Grimke was a pastor, faithful pastor, in Washington, D.C. In D.C., over a period of four months, there were around 50,000 cases reported and 3,000 D.C. residents died. So at the peak of the pandemic, the government banned all public gatherings, including churches. The first Sunday that they returned to gathering, Francis Grimke uh, preached a sermon. It was called Some Reflections Growing Out of the Recent Epidemic of Influenza That Affected Our City. And he looked back on that time and he said in that sermon that when he first realized that they would not be able to meet, well, this is what he says, I started to worry at first as it seemed to upset all of our plans for the fall work. But soon I recovered my composure. I said to myself, why worry? God knows what he is doing. His work is not going to suffer. It will rather be a help to it in the end. Out of it, I believe great good is coming. He said all the churches as well as the community at large are going to be the stronger and better for this season of distress through which we have been passing. I read that and how hope rises in my heart. Covenant fellowship, church family whom I love so dearly. God knows what he's doing. God knows knows what he's doing. He has good things for his people in the midst of the storm. Presently, our hearts are heavy and we know that great trouble and sorrow lies ahead in the months to come. But God knows what he's doing. And I am confident that on the other side of this trial, our faith our faith in Christ will be even stronger. Our love for one another will be deeper. Our hope will shine more brightly. Our Father is doing a work in us and through us. That our joy would be fuller. That Christ would be more precious to us. That the power of the gospel would spread through us to save a lost and dying world. We believe that God is capable of these things and using this time to accomplish these things. You know, Ramona Doyle shared with me that the Lord keeps bringing to mind one word. It's the word opportunity. Opportunity. This is not just a trial. This is a great opportunity for each one of us. The Lord is removing distractions, removing the things that compete for attention in our lives. And he's using this season as an opportunity to recenter our lives and our affections on Jesus Christ. Ramona said in the email that she sent, for those who embrace this opportunity, for those who embrace this opportunity, what the Lord does will be life-changing. He stands poised to pour out his spirit for a drawing near to God, freedom from addictions, healing in relationships and marriages, loving the world less and the Lord more, renewed hope and passion for the word of God. Opportunity. In other words, God is growing us in faith, love, and hope for our good and for his glory. Church family, let's continue to trust him together. Amen.